This place is ancient, like a world between worlds. Hey, welcome back Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. So, since Ahsoka's fifth episode, Shadow Warrior, a lot more people have become familiar with the world between worlds. You know, that weird realm that connects all of time and space in the Star Wars universe. Kind of like the warp levels in Super Mario Brothers with a dash of the Rainbow Road. It's called a road, it's called a Rainbow Road. It is a road that you go. So that got us wondering, who else has been to the world between worlds besides Ahsoka and Ezra Bridger? Who first found himself there on Star Wars Rebels? I mean, if it's been sitting in the Star Wars galaxy since, I guess, the beginning of time, surely other Star Wars characters have visited this place at some point. Probably ones who have powerful connections to the Force, you know, like Ben Kenobi. That wizard's just a crazy old man. In fact, I think it's actually quite likely that Obi-Wan has visited the world between worlds before. The evidence is right there in the movies. Now, before I get ahead of myself, let me quickly go over what the world between worlds actually is, when we've seen it, and why it seems like Obi-Wan is no stranger to this place. But I was only in there to get directions on how to get away from there. I'm also going to talk about how the world between worlds might even be how Obi-Wan became a Force ghost, how maybe it's the key to understanding how all Force ghosts work in Star Wars. But first, let's talk about the World Between Worlds, also known as the Virgin Scatter, which was first introduced in Star Wars Rebels. Now, when it debuted, it was pretty controversial for a lot of Star Wars fans because it was one of the biggest additions to the mythology in a long time, and it kind of changed how the whole universe operates in Star Wars. It even looked a lot different from the aesthetics we associate with Star Wars. It looked more like it's out of 2010's Tron Legacy. <laughs> It's a metaphysical gateway dimension that has portals to different locations across the Star Wars galaxy, and maybe even other galaxies. More importantly, these portals also go to different time periods, meaning that someone could use the world between worlds to travel through time. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious now, Ezra Bridger used the World Between Worlds to rescue Ahsoka Tano in the past, which is how Ahsoka first learned of its existence. In episode 5 of her own show, we see her speak to and duel with Anakin Skywalker in The World Between Worlds. Or was it? We recently made another video going deeper into that encounter between Ahsoka and her former master, where we wondered if maybe it wasn't The World Between Worlds at all, but instead a Force vision that happened entirely in her head. The show kind of leaves it unclear, but you know what, really it could be either. But let's just assume that it was was the world between worlds and Ahsoka, the same metaphysical space that we've already seen in Rebels. Sure, it looks a little different, but we did only briefly see it in Rebels. We don't even know that that was all of it. In fact, it probably wasn't. It would be a little weird if the interdimensional hub that can connect to any point in all of time and space is like smaller than Madison Square Garden. It's pretty big. I guess. Ahsoka had fallen off a cliff and was later rescued nearby in the same ocean. So if she was in the actual world between worlds, that means that she kind of instantly teleported there, which isn't so hard to believe. I mean, it's literally a mystical realm that transports you through time. It doesn't need to have like a physical front door that you need to walk through just to get inside. It better knock, I suppose. Ahsoka traveled there through the force, whether it was just her spirit or her whole physical body somehow went there and then came back again. I would bet though that any force user with enough power and practice could will themselves to go there through deep meditation and communication with the Force. And you know who had plenty of downtime for deep meditation and communication with the Force? Detroit? No, dude, not Detroit. Why would it be Detroit? I don't know. I hear people talk about Detroit sometimes. No, not Detroit. Obi-Wan Kenobi. He spent a lot of time alone in the desert on Tatooine, and it's not like there was much else to do after a day at the Desert Whale Factory. Knife goes in, guts come out. Knife goes in, guts come out. After saving Leia and confronting Vader nine years before the events of A New Hope, Obi-Wan makes a renewed effort to connect to the Force. It's probably in these years, with Qui-Gon's guidance, that he was able to meditate deep enough to visit the world between worlds. After all, at this point, Obi-Wan is a Jedi Master, arguably one of the best to ever do it. But Qui-Gon implies that he has a lot of training ahead of him. Come on, we've got a ways to go. So what is he teaching him? How to be a Force ghost? Well, we'll get to that, but he was probably also teaching him about the world between worlds and how to meditate hard enough to take himself there at will. There, Obi-Wan could access some of the major events in Star Wars history, including from a certain point of view, the future. If Obi-Wan could travel through time, why wouldn't he stop the Empire from ever forming? He could he just go back and kill Palpatine when he was a baby. Somehow Palpatine never existed. Well, now you see why the world between worlds is so controversial for a lot of us fans. The fact is, it's still very unclear how time travel and altering the past works in Star Wars. Ezra saved Ahsoka, but it didn't really change the way events unfolded after she disappeared. Maybe history can change. Maybe every change creates a new alternate timeline. Or maybe everything always happens the way it's supposed 
supposed to happen, including time travel. Kind of like in Lost. It was really confusing. Yeah, well, get used to it. So, Obi-Wan never changed the past, but he could see the future. He may have even seen that Luke would one day be able to defeat Vader and end the Empire, but he would need his sister Leia to do it. That's why in A New Hope, once Obi-Wan sees that Luke and Leia are reunited, he knows that events are on the right track. He can then allow himself to be sacrificed and not worry about the Rebellion still needing him around, at least corporally speaking. This could also be how Obi-Wan traveled even further into the future, all the way to the sequel trilogy. Remember, Rey hears his voice in The Force Awakens. Rey? And then again in Rise of Skywalker. Somehow Palpatine returned. Remember that Force users can hear sounds emanating from the world between worlds even if they're still on terra firma. Jason was able to hear Ahsoka and Anakin dueling with their lightsabers. So when Rey hears Obi-Wan's voice, he could literally just be standing outside the door that leads to the time of the sequels, whispering sweet nothings through the portal. Do I smell Pantene? Do I smell? Now maybe he did the exact same thing to Luke during the Death Star Trench Run. Use the Force, Luke. Now see, that's just silly. That wasn't Obi-Wan Kenobi alive in the world between worlds. That was his Force ghost. Okay, so that's a good point. So let's talk about why some Jedi are Force ghosts and others are not. And that will help you understand why Anakin was in the world between worlds and why that is proof that Obi-Wan is in the world between worlds as well. So the Force really works in two ways. There's the cosmic force that guides the will of the galaxy. May the Force be with you, etc. May the Force be with you. I have encountered divergence in the Force. We'll bring balance to the Force. With the will of the Force. And then there is the living Force. That is the energy that's actually generated by all living things. Now, most Jedi focus their attention on the will of the cosmic Force. But Qui-Gon Jinn was a student of the living Force. It's why he told Obi-Wan, Be mindful of the living Force, young Padawan. Now, because Qui-Gon was so focused on the living energy of the Force, his mind was able to remain intact after his death, which is why we hear Qui-Gon's voice in Yoda's vision in Episode 2, and why Yoda tells Obi-Wan, In your solitude, training I have for you, your old master. How to commune with him, I will teach you. So Qui-Gon developed this technique to hang on to his consciousness, and then Yoda learned it in a Clone Wars arc. And then Qui-Gon's ghost taught it to Obi-Wan, and presumably Obi-Wan's spirit taught this to Luke, and Luke taught it to Leia, so that's why they are all Force ghosts. But then why does Anakin become a Force ghost? Well, there is a short story in Return of the Jedi from a certain point of view that is from the point of view of Anakin's spirit as Obi-Wan welcomes him back from the beyond. So Obi-Wan actually taught Anakin's spirit how to hold on through the living Force. So if Anakin's spirit is able to appear in the world between worlds, then it would make sense if Obi-Wan, Yoda, Luke, and the rest can also reside in this realm. So whenever Obi-Wan talks to Luke in A New Hope, Obi-Wan has accessed this moment through a portal in the world between worlds to give Luke these instructions. And this also fits in perfectly with another aspect of the world between worlds. See, you can't really use the realm to access any point in space and time. The portals only seem to access important places or events that like, connect to the Force. For example, we have the deaths of Jedi, or very famous duels, and this is why Obi-Wan only appears to Luke at certain key moments, like at a near-death experience or on the Force planet of Dagobah. So we think that there's a way that these Force ghosts can find the time and space they want and then communicate through the portal rather than physically enter it like Ezra did on Rebels. In fact, this is probably a built-in failsafe to keep people from directly altering the past. Then again, it's also possible that this was not Anakin's Force ghost or that Force ghosts aren't even real ghosts. See, what if if the world between worlds can store psychic imprints of the Jedi who have connected with it. Shadows of themselves that look like them and think like them and have their memories. Kind of like the holograms of Jor-El and Man of Steel or Harry Seldon in Foundation. That way, Jedi who really do deserve to go to paradise after they die, like Yoda and Obi-Wan, still get to go to Jedi heaven. The world between worlds keeps a sort of copy of them behind for the benefit of everyone else while still letting them fully move on to wherever it is we go when we die. Since the world between worlds exists outside of time, like the TVA and Loki, once a Force ghost is left in there, it can then interact with anyone at any point in the past, present, or future. If this is the case, when someone like Luke or Rey is communicating with a Force ghost, they are actually connecting with and interfacing with the world between worlds, which is why other people cannot see Force ghosts. Typically, Force users are interacting with physical reality, moving things around, defying gravity, healing wounds, generating lightning. It's all a lot of simple tricks and nonsense. 
but part of the force, like visions and dreams of the future, don't have a basis in the physical world. Those clairvoyant powers come from the living force and are probably connected to the fourth dimensional world between worlds. Anakin's nightmares about Padme dying during childbirth are not prophecies, but instead they're him subconsciously tapping into the world between worlds and seeing things that, fourth dimensionally, are already occurring. So communicating with force ghosts or shadows of the Jedi that are preserved within the world between worlds would be another aspect of that power. Qui-Gon Jinn was a big believer in the living force, and he was the first character we saw outside of the expanded universe to become a force ghost and communicate with the living. So it tracks that all of this is connected in this way. So bringing it all back to Ahsoka, that's exactly what Hayden Christensen was playing. He was not Anakin's force ghost or part of a spirit left behind or a manifested memory of Ahsoka's. He was somehow all of the above. He didn't glow blue because Ahsoka was dealing with him directly in the world between worlds instead of channeling him there from the physical world like Luke usually would. If this is the case, then the world between worlds can be used to access force ghosts for the rest of time. You don't have to worry about Yoda or Obi-Wan eventually passing on to heaven or whatever. Copies of their essence will always be at the ready for advice. And we've seen Obi-Wan appear to Luke and speak to Rey, but if he accessed the world between worlds during his exile and left a psychic imprint of himself there, then we could see him again. Hello there. Ewan McGregor seemed to be having fun coming back for his own series. Made me feel like a kid again. So I wouldn't be surprised if he shows up again as Obi-Wan at some point, whether it's the Heir to the Empire movie or even something unexpected like the Acolyte. If Force Ghost transcend time, then there's no reason he can't show up hundreds of years in the past. Now, if Force Ghosts really do originate in the Virgin Scatter, it could have some exciting possibilities for the upcoming Star Wars films. For example, the Chain Worlds Theorem, that's the in-universe explanation of the world between worlds, is actually found in one of the Jedi texts that Luke kept on Fish Nun Island. We specifically see Rey save this text before the tree library burns down. Maybe in the upcoming new trilogy of Star Wars movies starring Rey, we will see her use what she's learned to visit the world between worlds herself. She can communicate with previous visitors, turn force ghosts like Luke, Yoda, and Obi-Wan. She can even learn how to leave an imprint of herself behind so that in Star Wars stories years from now, even Rey can return as a force ghost. Somehow, Rey returned. That's why the Yoda of the original trilogy, who traveled into the future and saw Rey save the scrolls that she needed in the future trilogy, knew that it was okay to burn down the library in the sequel trilogy. <laughs> exactly. It was really confusing. So, what did you guys think of this theory? Big shout out to the writer, Jack Picone. Let us know your thoughts down in the comments below or at either of us on our socials. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.